starting this new series called Dangerous Prayers, and it's based off a book by Craig Groeschel called Dangerous Prayers because following Jesus was never meant to be safe. So we're going to be, I would encourage you to read this book. We've got it in the marketplace, so you can pick one up on your way out, but I'm going to give this one away. Nobody wants it. Oh, saw that hand over there first. Come on, give it to her. Stand up here and give us a speech. So for the next week, three weeks, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at dangerous prayers, and I call them dangerous is because if you decide to pray these prayers, you better look out um, because uh, they, 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 they are dangerous. They're not your ordinary, tame, run-of-the-mill, kind of sterile, protect me, bless me, help me kind of prayers. Um, and so we're going to look at these prayers, and if you decide to pray these prayers, and I say decide, I mean, because these are... I'm not going to undersell this to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you right now, you better pray about praying these prayers. <laughs> God, should I pray these dangerous prayers? I mean, because I'm telling you, when you do this, it'll take your relationship with God to another level if you have the guts to pray them, because and I, it, it, they will make you uncomfortable. And so the book is going to cover some, uh, 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 the book is going to cover some dangerous prayers like God search me. That's what David prayed. David said, God, if there is any Thing inside me that I don't see. Would you search me and show me? He, we're gonna, the book's going to cover prayers uh, like, God, break me. Lord, break me for what breaks your heart. And the other dangerous prayer is, send me. You know, God, send me anywhere you want except China, right? Never pray that prayer. I'm going to tell you right that. No, we, when we were starting our children's, when we were starting this church, we had a, a, a family, um, a group of people, about 11 people that moved up here from Central Florida, and we were all gathered in my living room going, okay, I'll do this, and I'll do this. And I remember uh, Sandy Metcalf goes, I'll do anything but children. And guess what? She was our children's person for 12 years. So if you don't want to do something, you shouldn't pray that. But anyway, send me. That's the prayer that says, you know, God, whatever you want, I'm available. I'm here for you, anything you want. Now, for the next couple of weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on some prayers that aren't in the book. And so our dangerous prayer today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 4. And we're just going to jump right into it because I need to set some things up here. So in, book, in Acts, chapter 4, uh, Jesus has already risen from the dead, okay? He's already gone unto heaven. This is Acts, it's called the Acts of the Apostles. It's after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are the Gospels. That's the four accounts of Jesus' life. And then you have the Acts of the Apostles. It's actually written by Luke, who wrote the book of Luke. So in chapter two, we see the start of the church. And in chapter four, Peter and John, with great faith, are in the temple in Jerusalem, and they're preaching about the death and the resurrection of Jesus, and during that time, there was a man there present who hadn't walked in 40 years. And God miracul miraculously heals this man. So now he's able to walk and to leap and to praise God. But the problem is, is that the Fa Pharisees and the Sadducees and some of the religious leaders thought that Peter and John are starting to lead this cult that's starting to get out of control. So they arrest Peter and John and put them in prison. The next day, they bring them out of prison, they surround them, you know, they get around them, and they ask them this question, by what authority are you doing these miracles? This, this, by, in whose name are you preaching the messages that you're preaching? And this is how Peter responded. He says this, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but God, whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. So suddenly, they have a big problem on their hands because these religious leaders are looking and going, okay, here's a guy who couldn't walk. Now, for 40 years, he couldn't walk. Now he can walk, so we've obviously got a miracle on our hands. But if we don't get a hold of this thing, this movement's going to take control and take over all of Jerusalem. So they, they say, we need to shut this down. So they threaten them and they tell them, we're going to let you go, but you're not allowed to preach the name of Jesus anymore. And you're not allowed to do these miracles. I don't know how you're doing these miracles, but you can't do these miracles. So you need to stop talking about Jesus. And if you talk about Jesus, we're going to arrest you, we're going to beat you, and we're going to execute you. Don't think that you're going to get out of this without, without your lives. So here's Peter and John, and they're being threatened to potentially not only be beaten and tortured, but to lose their life. What do you think they did? They did what I would do. They prayed. But they didn't pray what I would pray, because I'd be praying, oh, God, help me. God, save me from these bad people. This is not what I signed up for. 
Lord, I thought I was going to have a nice job with a nice 401k and do my little surfing at the church and go to my soap group, and I just didn't want to bother anybody. I just want to be left alone, raise my kids as Christians. Man, this, that's, not, but that's not what they prayed. I'm telling you what, what would you do, right? What would you do if they prayed that prayer, if, if you were in that place? Now, they prayed under the threat of death. If you talk about this again, we will execute you. They prayed a dangerous prayer. Remember, Jesus, following Jesus was never meant to be safe. So I want to show you the prayer that they prayed. I want to go to that because this is going to be our dangerous prayer this week. And this is the prayer that we are going to pray as a church. You say, I ain't praying that. You actually do need to pray about whether you're going to pray this prayer because it is a dangerous prayer. But I'm hoping that it would become a prayer, a part of our prayer life for the rest of our life. So look at this. In response to this death threat, look what they prayed. This is what they got down on their knees and asked God. Now, Lord, consider their threats. And not consider their threats and save us. Consider their threats. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. How many of you, are you that courageous? I'm going to be honest with you, which is refreshing when a pastor says that, right? Because we've been lying up to this point. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know if I would have prayed a prayer like that if I'd have been in that kind of circumstance. I mean, they've arrested Jesus and executed him. Now they've got you there. They're telling you, don't preach in the name of Jesus. And if you do, you're next. And to think that your next response is, oh, Lord, give me the boldness to speak your word. Now, I think there's a lot of reasons why we don't really pray these kind of prayers in America. And one of the reasons, I think, is because we're so extraordinarily blessed that it's kind of taken the the sharpness off of us, you know what I'm saying? And listen, they're, they're never feel guilty about being blessed. I mean, that, we pray for the blessings of God, never feel guilty, but you should feel a responsibility. But we don't really pray these, and I think because we're so blessed, it almost makes us afraid. We're almost risk adverse, you know what I'm saying? In this country, we're so risk adverse, and we literally have nothing to be afraid of. We live in one of the safest communities in one of the safest countries in the world, but yet we're still scared. We're still worried. This whole mindset that has crept into our culture of, you know, you got to wear a helmet and have a seatbelt and a life jacket, and you got to keep a mask on and, and get insurance and make sure you're insured for that and sign the waiver form and da 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 has kind of crept into our church. It's kind of crept into the Christian culture. And the fact, if you're here today and you're a wouldn't call yourself a Christ follower, or you're not really a church person, and maybe you're watching online, you're at Crab Island, and you wouldn't call yourself a, Christian, you know, a Christ follower, and one of the reasons why you're skeptical is because you think the church is just full of hypocrites. I'm here, we're going to confirm your suspicions today. It, there, we are a bunch of hypocrites. And so if you, here's what I mean by that, if, if, if you're here and you're not a church person, what I'm going to talk about today doesn't really apply to you, so you get an out. You can just watch us squirm and watch us you know, kind of feel uncomfortable in our dysfunction. But honestly, I think we're so worried about what would happen to us if we prayed a prayer like this. When some of you have traveled to other parts of the world, especially underdeveloped countries, I think if there were Christians in other countries, like I've been to Indonesia, I've been to the Middle East, and I know there's Christians in those areas that just the thought of even confessing Christianity, they take the, it's, uh, they take the chance of losing their homes or their family. And I think if they heard some of the prayers that we prayed, I'm telling you, they'd laugh, maybe gag, maybe puke in their mouth. You know, because we Christians, I, this is one of the things that got me when, when I first became a Christ follower. I heard someone pray for the traveling mercies. You ever heard someone, and Lord, just give us traveling mercies. And I thought, who are the traveling mercies? Are they like, hi, I'm George Mer Mercy, and I'm Ethel Mercy, and we're the traveling mercies. We're going to be behind you in our RV, and I teach square dancing, and I do needlepoint, you know? Like, what are the traveling mercies? But seriously, we pray, oh, God, keep us safe. And I think some of the, if another, a Christian in another country heard that, they'd be thinking, have you seen our highways? We don't even have seatbelts. I've seen people in India riding, standing up, 20 people in the back of a pickup truck, standing up, not sitting down. And we're praying for safety, safety and we have some of the best highways in the world. You ever, you ever see a news article on Yahoo or Google and it says, uh, 50 passenger bus careens over a cliff in Colombia, kills 90 people. And you're like, wait a minute, how did, there's, it's a 50 passenger bus. How did 90 people die? I took a bus ride one time from Bogota to Cali, Cali in Colombia, 12 hours is overnight through the Andes mountains. And literally they oversold the bus and I had to stand for the whole 12 hours. And we'd come up to a police checkpoint and the guy would go, get down, get down. And everyone who was standing had to sit on the floor so they wouldn't see us. 
That's how 70 people die on a 50-passenger bus that careens over a cliff in Columbia. But seriously, we pray these prayers. Are you here, students? Our students will pray, God, just help me get through school. You got people in other countries praying that they would have the opportunity to go to school. Or they hear Americans pray, God, that you just bless us. And I think Christians in other parts of the world think, you already have everything. You already have every. You, you have so much money, you don't even keep it in your pockets. I don't carry change. It's too heavy. I just put it in my ashtray. You know, the, no, the, they don't even have that. Or, or we pray in other parts of the world. I think that I, if they could hear our prayers, I think they just think, how pathetic with all the safety that we have, all the possessions that we have, and we're still praying these anemic bless me, help me, protect me prayers. So what I want to do is I want to look at the prayers that the early, the leaders of the early church prayed, because when you look at the leaders of the early church, when they followed Jesus and then they, and then Jesus left and they became the leaders of the early church, something happened to them. Something happened in their prayers and whatever happened affected their courage. And what it really boils down to is I think we need to take a look at the type of prayers they prayed because maybe it'll help amp us up. Because after reading about them and what they do and studying for this, I'm convicted. I really am convicted. And it makes me think, what happened? Why are we so afraid? Why are we so afraid? Because we literally have nothing to be afraid of. So here's what I want to do. I want to look at what happened after these guys prayed this prayer. And there's, the reason why this prayer that they prayed and said, Lord, enable us to, for your servants to speak your word with boldness, the reason why it's so dangerous is because I believe that God answers this prayer. And when we, when we pray this prayer, God, you know, make me bold, I believe that one of the ways he answers it is he does give us a measure. This, in other words, something supernatural will happen in you. If you decide that you're going to have the guts to pray this prayer, God, make me bold, something supernatural can happen in you. In fact, case in point, Peter, the apostle Peter, when he was Jesus' disciple on the night that Jesus was arrested, Peter denied knowing Jesus three different times. And one of the times was to a 14-year-old girl. Imagine a middle school girl going, Hey, you know Jesus. No, I don't know. I don't know who that is. Uh Uh-uh. He did that. But then six weeks later, he steps out after the, the, that's called Pentecost, when the church was born, Acts chapter two, Jesus has already risen from the dead. Peter walks out onto the streets of Jerusalem in the very city where they crucified Jesus. And he preaches about the death and resurrection of Jesus and 5,000 people give their hearts and put their trust in their faith in Jesus. So there is an element of supernatural that happens when we pray this prayer, but there's also an element of personal responsibility that comes when we pray this prayer. That when we pray this prayer of, this dangerous prayer of being bold, it comes with an element of personal responsibility, and that's what we're going to see here in a moment. So let me set this up. We know they arrested James and John. They told them, don't preach in the name of Jesus anymore. We don't know how long after that this next event happens, whether the next day or a couple of days or a couple of months, but it is the next chapter. It doesn't say in then or when, how long it is, but in the next chapter, okay, we see the results of this prayer. We see the results of them praying this dangerous prayer. God, make us bold. Let us speak your word with boldness. Now, everybody is in Jerusalem. They're all from all over the world. They're there for the feast. So everybody's there. And the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders are trying to manage this delicate power of balance, balance of power between Rome lets us do what we want as long as it doesn't get out of control. If it gets out of control, they're going to come in and squash us. Now, because of the attention that the apostles, apostles are getting, because they're seeing miracles, people are coming daily and adding their faith and becoming a part of the early church, the attendance in, temple, in the temple is going down. So they decide to arrest all of the apostles. And so they arrest them all thinking, okay, we've got the ringleaders. We're going to put an end to this. And the plan is to leave them in jail overnight and then bring them in in the morning, just like they did with Peter and John, and scare the Jesus out of them. So that's what they do. They put them in jail. And Luke, again, who wrote the book of Acts, records that during the night, an angel comes to the prison and frees all the apostles. All right? Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm in that position... And I'm in the prison because I'm because of what I, you know, being persecuted or whatever. And God comes and opens the prison. I'm gonna take that as a sign that it's time to get out of Dodge, right? 
Here's God answering my prayers, protect me, it's time to leave. But that's not what happens. So the religious leaders come in in the next morning, they send for the apostles, and they come back, word comes back, says they're not there. So they're trying to figure out what's going on. They put an APB out on them, trying to figure out what happened to them. And while they're figuring it out, somebody else shows up and says, hey, you remember those guys you arrested and beaten last week or yesterday? Told them not to preach in the name of Jesus? Yeah. And the ones you arrested last night? Yeah. They're back in the temple. And they're preaching again about the death and resurrection of Jesus. Again, I would have been like, wait, you just got released from prison. Maybe you're... That's me, though. That's why I wasn't an apostle. So they're furious. So they send uh, the temple guard up to arrest them, but they're afraid to arrest them because there's tons of people around them. They're, they're preaching again, and they're afraid if we arrest them, we're going to get stoned. So they just kind of, one of them kind of goes up into the crowd and goes, hey, guys, would you mind coming back to the station for a few minutes and answer some questions? And they're like, sure. So they head back with them, the, with the temple guard, to this meeting with the religious leaders, and that's where we're going to pick it up in Acts chapter 5. Now, remember, this is what happened after they were persecuted. They were told not to preach in the name of Jesus, and they prayed this prayer, Lord, let us speak your word with boldness. So chapter 5, verse 27, it says, The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. He says, we gave you strict orders not to teach in his name. Don't you remember last chapter? And I think it's funny. Do you notice here they don't say the name of Jesus? They can't even say his name. You know, I think 2,000 years ago as well as today, you can talk about God you can talk about religion, but don't bring Jesus into it. They were just offended, just as offended back then as we are today, or the culture is today. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name. He said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Now, this is important because, listen, this is only two months after the resurrection. And the Sanhedrin are saying to the apostles, look, the way you tell this, it makes it look like we're guilty. <laughs> Peter's going, uh, because you are, right? Remember, I was there. This wasn't 50 years ago in some faraway city. You know, it wasn't in a galaxy far away. This was months ago. And you know, the reason it sounds like you're guilty of his arrest, his torture, his trial, and his execution is because you are, right? And Peter answers their question. He says, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. And then this next verse is kind of, I don't want you to miss this, because this is kind of, this is what puts Christianity kind of in a completely different category of other religions. If you've ever wondered, like, what's the difference? Just look at this next verse. He says, and we are witnesses of these things. In other words, we saw them. It wasn't something that we heard. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. In other words, all that stuff I just told you about, about Jesus being crucified and him rising from the dead, we don't just believe it because we heard about it and it's a great fairy tale. We know it happened because we saw him die. We had breakfast with him on, uh, on the beach three days later. And so we know about it because those events happened right here in this very city. So these guys are like, you know, if, and this is what I'm saying about the Christianity is that it's about, it's not about a book. It's not, we don't believe this because the Bible says it. We believe it because it's an event that actually happened. These guys put their, their faith and their trust, not in a, a writing or an idea, but in an event that they witnessed with their own eyes. So every chance they got to, they would speak about, talk about Jesus and the resurrection. Je it was like a broken record. Jesus and the resurrection, Jesus and the resurrection. That's what it was about. It says, verse 33, he says, then they heard this, that's the, the religious people, they heard this and they were furious and wanted to put them to death, which should not surprise us, right? I mean, they already put the ringleader, Jesus, to death. They're probably thinking in their minds, okay, we got him, now we'll just put this whole thing to rest, we'll arrest these 12 guys, or these 11, and we'll put them to death. But then something fascinating happens. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all, in fact, that name sounds familiar. Later on, we're going to hear from a guy named Apostle Paul. He used to be a religious leader as well, Jewish religious leader named Saul, and he studied under this guy. It says, Gamaliel, as a teacher of the law, was honored by all the people. He stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men, talking about the disciples, be put outside for a while. So he says, listen, guys, before we decide to execute another group of people and make 12 martyrs out of one, he says, wait, Yep, I have an idea. 
And so he asks them to step outside, and he shares the idea with the other Sanhedrin. He says, he addressed the Sanhedrin, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do with these men. In other words, we need to think about this first. Some time ago, Thaddeus appeared claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. So he says, remember Thaddeus, guys? And they're like, yeah, 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 we remember Thaddeus. Apparently, Thaddeus was a guy who came along, had some new revolutionary idea about overthrowing Rome, and you know, Rome says, I don't think so, and they squashed him like a bug, and so the movement went away. So he's like, remember Thaddeus? And they're like, oh yeah, I remember that thing. It didn't amount to anything. Yep, didn't go anywhere. And then he says, and after him, Judas, the Galilean, appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt, and he too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. So, so Gamaliel's going, remember that? Remember, remember we had Thaddeus, and then you got Judas, and that was a big movement. We thought, uh-oh, you remember what happened? They're like, yeah, I remember what happened. Rome came along, heard about it. They said, no, oh, no, you didn't. I don't think so. And they squashed him, right? So Gamaliel's saying, remember, guys, we didn't get involved. See, if we would have gotten involved and supported Judas, Rome would have squashed us. But if we had been against Judas publicly, the people of Israel would have turned against us. So we did it politically perfect, man. We didn't get involved. But when there was an uprising, we were like, hey, Rome, you better pay attention to this. And secretly, we were with the, new, with the people. We were going, no new taxes, no new taxes. But we stayed out of it. And what happened? Rome came in and solved the problem for us. So guys, maybe we shouldn't get our hands bloody. Let's just wait. Because Rome is not going to let anything get out of hand in this area. They're going to, uh, watch, they'll solve our problem for us. And then he says in this, he says in verse 38, Therefore, in this present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose, look at this, of, is of, of activity is of human origin, it will fail. The implication is, look, if this is just another movement with some radical zealots, who have some radical idea, it's going to fail. And do you, reason, you know why? Because Rome is not going to let it happen. And you need to understand this. Rome was not against Christianity in the first century. Rome was against any gathering or any movement that usurped their authority. It didn't matter what it was. And so Gam Gamaliel is right. He's saying, look, you know what? If this is just another human movement, pff, it'll never stand against Rome. Rome will crush it. But then he says this in verse 39, but... If it's from God, you'll not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. Now, listen to the implication of that statement. Here's what he's saying. The only thing that could overcome the power and authority and the control of Rome I'm in this region of the world, it will take an act of God. If there's going to be a movement, a breakthrough movement that's going to overthrow Rome, God's going to be, have to be behind it. And if he's behind it, we don't want to be found fighting against it. Now, has anybody ever been to Rome? Just raise your hand if you've been to Rome. Rome has the most crosses in any city of the world displayed all over Rome. It's everywhere, right? There's no Roman Empire anymore, but there's the city of Rome. And Rome is often considered by many people to be the capital of Christianity. You have Mecca as far as Islam. Well, Christianity, many people consider Rome the capital. Think about the implications of what Gamaliel said, because the only thing that could strong arm Rome and create something bigger than Rome was what? An act of God. That's actually what happened, right? So he convinces them. Verse 40, his speech persuaded them, and they called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let him go. You know, we used to just, if, if, before the passion of the Christ, we used to think, you know, go, go breeze right through that statement, flogged, you know, oh, they got whipped, right? But that, uh, we changed, how many saw the passion of the Christ back 15 years ago, 16 years, whatever it was? That kind of changed our image of what flogged meant. Flogged, in some cases, meant death. Because being flogged, this was a Roman, this was a Roman instrument of torture. You were flogged, when they flogged you, it was a cat of nine tails, nine leather straps, that had like this, a metal, a metal weight, or if they were improvising, have a bone or a piece of glass or a stick, but they liked the metal because it, the big metal weight would soften your flesh, and then this little spike would pull your skin off. And so 
when we talk about, you, you just don't breeze by that scripture and go, oh, they were flogged. They were, they were whipped. They just got whipped and then they left. They let them go. No, think about this. They were beaten until their skin pulled off. You're talking several hours or a half a day. You stood in line as you watched the guards permanently scar one of your best friends for talking about something that they'd seen. How would you respond? Again, the temptation is just to read through this and go, oh, they were whipped and then they they let them go. No, you're talking 11 guys, 12 guys standing there for a half a day, standing in line, waiting as you listen to one of your closest friends wince in pain and scream, knowing that you're next because of something you said that you believe or even more importantly, something that you said you saw. If you're, I mean, if you were there, if I was there, I'd think, well, this is over, right? But listen to this. So we go to the next, the next verse that says they were flogged and let them go, and you go to the next verse and think, oh, that just, uh, hey, don't speak in Jesus anymore, bye. No, you're talking a half a day of hearing your friends be whipped and have the flesh pulled off their back, and then it's your turn, and then look what happens. Verse 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing. Because they've been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. You know, wait a minute. For the rest of your life, people will see your scars and think that you're a criminal. Because, you know, they didn't have passports and driver's license and state-issued IDs. You know, when they wanted to know who you were or what you were about, you either had sometimes a tattoo or you were branded or you had a, a kind of certain piercing in your ear or they ripped the shirt off your back and said, oh, You must be a criminal of the state of Rome because no one would have those scars unless they were a criminal. You are permanently marked and scarred. And now compare this to us. I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer, but, you know, we get get scared because we think something negative is going to happen to us. And our forefathers are like, are you kidding me? To be disfigured, to have suffered, to lost something in the name of Jesus? was the greatest honor. How different is it in our... I know you're like, glad I went to church. It's so uplifting. It's going to get better, believe me. I got to make it bad. I got to give... But No, but think about it. We live in some of the safest neighborhoods, in the safest community, in the safest country in the world. I know people in this... There's communities, gated communities, that have two gates. They have two sets of guards. You go through one, and then you go through another one to get to their house. In Destin, not like we're in Pakistan or something, and we're afraid. We're afraid that somebody's not going to like us, or afraid that we might make a D if I say something, or afraid that they won't be my tennis partner anymore, or I won't get into that fraternity. You know, the, our forefathers, if they lived in this country, they'd come home going, that happened again. I lost a bonus. Didn't get a bonus this year. What happened? Was it the name? Yeah, it was the name. I didn't get in. I got kicked out of that club. What? Because of the name? Yeah, because of the name. What happened to us? I'll tell you what happened. I think part of it is we're so extraordinarily blessed. And again, don't feel guilty for being blessed. We have a responsibility. We have to be good stewards of the blessing. But instead of being grateful and good stewards, we've allowed it to strip us of our boldness. And listen, I tell you this all the time. I'm not preaching at you because I can't write this and not feel convicted. I can't, I mean, I'm not an exception Believe me, I just go, you know, I'm not going to say anything. I just want to live my life and be safe. Not be safe, but I just, let, leave me alone. I'm just going to live my life. I'm going to go fishing. Look what they did. Look what it happens. This is, this is how it ends. Day after day in the temple courts, back out in public, right? And from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news of Jesus is the Messiah. You know why we're here today? Because they never stop proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. And this was after they were flogged. Good thing I didn't let that go, huh? That would have sucked. On the first service, I was walking in with a caught with some lady's hair, pulled her wig off, right? What do you do with this? I mean, how do, how do we respond to this? I mean, you're probably thinking right now, okay, great, but I don't live in Pakistan. What am I going to do? Because you know what? As I was studying this, I'm like, what's the, what am I going to do? Come up here and go, go, all right, so go out and get flogged. You're like, okay. No, that's not what flogged means. All right, this isn't church at Crab Island. We're getting flogged, man. No, that's not what I'm talking about. But here, 
Here's why this prayer is so dangerous. This is why I'm, you know, Eric, you're not selling it very well, because I don't want you to, because this is a dangerous prayer. Because yes, if you decide, Lord, make me bold, and you decide you're going to pray this prayer, I believe there is an element that God will give you an element of supernatural boldness. You ask God, God is going to give it to you, okay? It, yet, but here's what you have to remember, that boldness is still subject to you. In other words, you can pray for boldness, and God will give you a measure of the boldness, but you still have a choice to make. And I think that's the real answer to this prayer is that the answer to this prayer is that when you pray this prayer, God make you bold. The answer is that God will bring you an opportunity to be bold. You pray a prayer like this and you'll find yourself in a situation where you are faced with the choice, am I gonna say something right now? See, because we pray for boldness like, like it's some pixie dust that sprinkles on us and I got courage. No, here's what'll happen. If you have the guts to pray this prayer, There'll be a measure of supernatural, and I say measure, because why should God dump it on you if you won't take advantage of the opportunity that he brings you? Because that's the second part of the prayer. God will give you a measure of some boldness, but then he's going to put you in an opportunity that says, are you going to step through the door? Are you going to say something? Are you going to do something? Are you going to pray for them? And if you won't walk through it, why should I dump a bunch of boldness on you? So there is that supernatural, but there is also the op application that we have, and that is personal responsibility. And that's why you have to be, you got to consider, you need to pray about whether you're going to pray this prayer. Because I guarantee you pray this prayer, you're going to be put in a situation where you have an opportunity to step out. Now, because we're not used to this, because we don't really know how to do this, what I want to do is give you a couple of baby steps, okay? And listen, you're going to hear these steps and you're going to go, Eric, compared to what the apostles went through, they were flogged and lost their life. That's nothing. I know. I get it. But we, we're not there. So we need to start somewhere. No one, no one here is going to lose their home or their family or their job because of Christianity, because, of your, because you believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus. So we need to start somewhere. And besides that, we are the church. This is the church. Shoreline is not this building. It is all of us that are in this building. It's all of us that are watching online, even at Crab Island. We are the church. So we have the responsibility of the church, the big church, for this generation. And one day, we're going to pass it off to the next generation. That's why summer camp is so important, because we want to make sure they're ready. In fact, they may even have a tougher time in the, where our culture's going than we did. And so we want to make sure they're ready, and the condition of the church will be in the condition that we decide we're going to leave it in, and so maybe we need to amp up our boldness. But here's some suggestions, and they're so simple. They're so easy, not easy, but simple, okay? Here's the first one. Boldness is saying something when it would be easier to say nothing. See, that's just a step of, of boldness in our culture. Boldness is deciding to say something when it would just be easier to say nothing. I mean, we run into those situations all the time, don't you? Now, I just want to clarify something here. It doesn't mean that you get online and you're a complete idiot. But that's what happens all the time. It seems like, oh, I don't have a problem being bold. You know, but when it's in real life, we have a problem with it. But sometimes you're just in this situation where, you know, I really want to say something but I don't know, they, I'm afraid they won't like me and so we don't walk through it. Boldness is just saying something when it would be easier to say nothing. Number two, boldness is taking advantage of an opportunity when the time is right. When the time is right and you know, it'll, and I guarantee you, listen, here's what'll happen. When you pray this prayer, you'll be presented with an opportunity and you'll recognize it. You know, when I, I told this story before, when I was younger and I lived here, we went camping. We'd take, I had a little John boat, me and my friends, we'd go out to Indian Bayou. There was no houses out there back then. Can you believe that? It was just a sandbar and a beach on the point where you came into the bayou, where Maddie Kelly's place is now. And we would camp there. And me and my friends, we would fish and we would um, do BB gun wars and bottle rocket wars. Anybody grow up doing that? You know, shooting be, be, bottle rockets where you're far away, shooting each other, and then BBs, right? And that's what we do all weekend, cook, fish, and play BB gun wars. A week later, some friends of mine come, back to, come to school, and they went camping in the same spot, and they came back with all this Indian pottery and some arrowheads, and we're like, where'd you find it? And they told us it was in the same exact spot. How come we didn't see it? Because we weren't looking for it. You start praying this prayer, and you're going to see it. And so you have to take advantage of the opportunity when the time is right. Because let me tell you, God doesn't, you pray this prayer, it's not gonna be like, all of a sudden God takes control of your mouth and you just are bold and you're like, who was that guy? I don't know, I couldn't control it. It's not, 
You know what you're going to get? You're going to get an opportunity where someone says, yeah, just things aren't going very well right now. We just got married, and it's been really tough. And God's going to go, bing, 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 bing. You prayed for an opportunity to be bold. Here it is. Go ahead. Say something, say something, say something, say something. That's it. He's going to go, what are you going to do with that? So we want to help you. Here's what we did. Um, on your Instagram, homes, we've got a screen for it. We've got a wallpaper for your home screen. And it says two things, be bold, pray bold. Be bold, no, it's supposed to be pray bold, so that one's wrong, actually. We have the right one right here. Pray bold and be bold, because that's the first thing. And what we're doing is, because everybody, you got the little thing that says how much time you spend on your phone, comes up every week, and you're like, holy crap, I spend three and a half hours a day on my phone? That, put this on there, and it'll remind you to first pray bold. And we're going to pray this prayer this week as a church. I'm a, and if you say, Eric, I'm not ready to pray that, guess what? I'm praying it for you. <laughs> I've got to pray it for you. Pray bold, be bold. So what this reminds you of, every time you look at your phone, you open it up, it's on your f- home screen, you go, okay, God, I'm praying for an opportunity that you give me words of boldness, that I would be able to speak your word with boldness. I'd be able to tell my story with boldness. And then when the opportunity presents itself, you'll recognize it and you'll be bold. Pray bold and be bold. Now listen, I'm not asking you to be, because I used to go to Hog's Breath and there was a bunch of guys that would stand out there. Remember Hog's Breath, Baton Fort Walton? You go in there to go drink, and there'd be a bunch of evangelists going, if you go into hog's breath, you're going to hell, you know. There'd be, they're not serving alcohol in heaven. And they'd yell at him. And, they, and then they, we would throw things at him. We'd take fire extinguishers and extinguish them and throw beers at them when we drove by. And they know what they do? they go, persecuted in the name of Jesus. And we were like, no, you're just a jerk, okay? I'm not asking you to be a jerk because boldness in the right amount is very attractive, Okay, it's like salt. You don't dump salt all over your food. You put enough to give it flavor. Okay, we've talked about this before. So you want to, you know, just see the boldness as far as recognize the opportunity and then take the moment to walk into that boldness. Because when you pray for boldness, God's going to answer your prayer with an opportunity. And I, again, one of the reasons why I think we're, there's two reasons, again, why I think we're, we're not very bold. Because some of us, have been Christians for a long time and we've forgotten what it's like to be far from God. We've forgotten what it's like to not have peace with God because for the last 30 years I've had peace with God. And so that kind of affects our boldness. The other is that I think we're so busy, we get so distracted that God brings those opportunities for us to talk about him or to tell our story and we don't recognize him because we're too busy. But it's so simple. It's so normal. It's so easy. It's recognizing the opportunity. Boldness is saying something when you want to be easier not to say anything. And the boldness is recognizing the opportunity when it presents itself. And I'm going to tell you, one day, someone is going to sit across the table from you and say, because of you, I'm where I am with God now. We're doing baptisms at Crab Island today. So one day, someone's going to, before they get baptized, going to say, you know what? Because of Graham or because of you, because of John, because of whoever's boldness, you know, because they had the guts to talk to me, why I'm standing here today. And it's so simple and it's so easy. And yeah, it may cost you, but remember, following Jesus was never meant to be easy. He never promised in this life that you'd have streets of gold. So let's pray. Would you bow your heads? And we're going to pray this as a church. And I want this to be your prayer if you have the guts to pray it. And I say guts because it's, you will be faced with the opportunity and it's scary be scary for you, but think about our forefathers. They considered it a blessing. They considered it to be able to suffer in the name of Jesus because of what he did. And Father, we, we love so much your expression of love towards us by sending your son, Jesus, who took on the form of a man and didn't come to be served, but to serve and to offer his life as a ransom for all of us. And then you in turn said that the greatest in the kingdom is those that serve others We saw the apostles who served with their lives. Lord, thank you, first of all, so much for the blessings of living in the United States of America, and thank you for the jobs that we have and the blessings that we have. We understand we're probably in the top 1% of rich people in the whole world. Lord, never let us forget where these blessings come from, and never let us forget the peace we have because of what you've done. But God, today we stand here as a church, and we, wanna, we, we have the courage to say, like the apostles said, Lord, enable us to speak your word with boldness. 
God, that we would pray for boldness, that you would make us supernaturally bold, but most of all, we'd have the courage to step through the door when you present it, knowing that someone's life hangs in the balance, the eternity of our community hangs in the balance. God, how can we be so afraid when you have blessed us with so much? Lord, we love you and praise you and thank you for answering these prayers. In Jesus' name, amen.